Palm Sunday triggers Jesus' journey into Jerusalem to fulfill His destiny of going to the cross and paying the ransom for our sins, purchasing our redemption, our salvation, and eternal life for all of us, and the promises that give us an abundant life here on this planet. He came to die, but not to stay dead, but to be resurrected, and we're going to celebrate that next week. But what would he tell his disciples in those three and a half years? What would he tell his disciples and by extension to us, especially in the Passion Week? From Palm Sunday to Good Friday, what would he say? We've looked at the promise of his presence. He says, be assured, even though I'm leaving, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And he said, also with that, my presence will bring the promise of my power and greater works will you do because I go to the Father where he today is at the right hand of Father God praying our prayers that we pray and offer up to him at the right hand of the throne of grace. There is nothing beyond his reach and power and possibility, but quite often we never know how great he is until there's a challenge or adversity and we have to dig deep. And then we find out, wow, the inheritance of his presence and his power, as Russell led us into this morning with his opening prayer, only then do we find out how real that is. And today, we want to talk about the promise of increase. Because as he was leaving, the disciples were left with a mission that would be beyond their comprehension. He says, don't worry. For whatever I've called you on this earth to do, I'll equip you with. I'll give you the resources. I'll give you the finances. I'll give you what you need if you fulfill the condition. And so here's what he's saying in Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. That's a key word in this passage. Four times he uses it. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. For is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, say anxious. Some of you came in anxious this morning. None of, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the, for the Gentiles or outsiders seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And here's the kicker. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let's break it down. We glean four things out of many things we could pick on this morning from a rich text and passage of Scripture. The first thing Jesus says is, fret not. Fret not. Don't be anxious about your life. I get anxious. How many of you get anxious? How many of you are anxious today? How many of you were anxious coming to church because those kids were giving you fits? How many were you anxious because your wife was giving you That's okay. We better not move on in this whole situation. Get a little too personal, right? Well, the word anxious in Scripture actually means to be troubled or worried. Troubled or worried, whether it's the economy because of, an, of a president that seems to be going from left to right, right to left, or the nuclear missile drills, and being a target, we know this. God is in control because the kingdom of God is greater than the kingdoms of this world. And he's trying to establish this truth. Worry, if you know, is a perceived fear of what has not yet happened. And they say worry is the greatest stress there is. It saps us of energy. So when we worry what happens, it produces nothing, right? But God is faithful, and He provides everything. It provides everything. If we focus on ourselves, we stress. If we focus on Him, we rest. Every one of us here have come in with challenges. Here is the key. Focus first on the kingdom of God. Focus first on God's kingdom. 
We break this passage open. We go back to that last verse, which many people, are, are, they quote and are most familiar with, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, but seek first. Why is Jesus saying this? Again, as we say over and over, when Jesus gives an explicit command that seems to be obvious, it may be mentally and conceptually obvious, but it's one that won't be obeyed because the natural tendency of you and I is to put ourselves first. It is. It's to put the kingdom of self first and what we need and what we want. We know we should put him first. We know we should put his kingdom first. But the natural tendency in the pressures of life, in the anxiousness of life, is we end up putting ourselves first. And we say, God, you'll understand. And he does. And so we pray. And then Jesus says, knowing that, when he teaches us how to pray, the Lord's Prayer, which is primarily an outline and not a prayer. It's a format, a guide. He says, pray then like this. In fact, let's pray it together. Can we pray it together? Just a few lines. Are you ready? Let's read together. It's on the screens. You have your scripture. Open your Bible. Open your device, but don't look at the NCAA scores. All right? Can we do this? Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you very much. You sounded awesome. What is Jesus saying? When you pray, first hallow my name. For 22 minutes this morning, we hallowed his name in worship and praise. We lifted our hands. We lifted our voices. Some of us were looking around. That, that's okay. Because we are inspired by the fact that others are worshiping. When I was new, I looked at, around at everybody. If you're here in church this morning and you're going, what are these people doing making touchdown signs? Don't worry. I looked a lot. And then I realized what they're doing is surrendering to God in worship. Jesus says you enter prayer that way. You enter with gratitude. You enter with focusing on how great he is and how big he is. And then he says, pray for yourself. No, he doesn't say that. This is where we miss it. The key to answered prayer then is to pray for his kingdom to come. What does the word kingdom mean? The word kingdom means the place of his influence, his reign, and his rule. That's all that is. So what is God saying? God's saying, first focus on me when you come to prayer. Then focus on what I want before you focus on what you want. Ouch. If we will make that shift, our heart will change. We'll become less selfish. We'll become more selfless. And the heart that God blesses is the selfless life. Not the selfie life. <laughs> right? People have died trying to take selfies, falling on train tracks and in front of cars. It's tragic. God has never meant for us to be consumed with ourselves. And so Jesus says, when you pray, even though you're anxious, come with worship and thanksgiving. Focus on me because I'm bigger than your problem. And then he says, pray for what I want Next, then he says, pray for what you need. God is always about, Jesus is saying, look, when I leave, you need to remember, you're going to have to exert a lot of remembrance and hold each other accountable not to be consumed with yourselves. As great as your need is, as great as your want is, as great as the challenge and adversity is, I know about that. But here is the way to get that need met. Be selfless. It's a contradiction. Some of us here this morning may be stuck because we've been faithful in praying for ourselves. It has been me, myself, and I. It's what we call the selfie trinity. I would suggest to you that if you follow the pattern of focusing first on God's kingdom and his pattern of kingdom prayer, what will happen is God will move you into a place to bless you and he'll position you to freely receive now the fruit of increase. How many of you want increase? Okay, not everybody. How many of you want decrease then? <laughs> all right. He says, all these things will be added to you. All of these things will be added to you. The word added in Scripture means increased. When you think about addition, you think one plus one plus one equals three. It's kind of incremental and gradual and small. But this word in Scripture actually means to gather, to gather a lot. More of the feeling here is to multiply rather than to minusculely add. He says, 
If you fret not, focus first on the kingdom. I will freely position you to receive the fruit of increase. The more we expand his kingdom and extend his kingdom by blessing others, the more he'll extend increase to us. Jesus spent his life trying to say, love people. Share the kingdom of God. Share me with others. And watch me move. It would be the task of the disciples when he would leave. Palm Sunday triggers the days before he would leave, he would ultimately go to the cross, then be resurrected on Easter, and then 40 days later be ascended back to the Father, where he prays for us today. And so, God wants to give you increase. It's his promise. It's his desire. It is his passion that we might fulfill his purpose. It's really want what he wants to do. But whom can he trust with increase where we don't realize that what he gives us is not just to make us rich, not just to make us successful, not just to consume the blessing and eat the seed that's supposed to multiply into the fruit to change lives. To those who get that, he blesses. Because a lot of people say, well, I believe that. I put God first, bro. Kingdom of God. Yeah. But what he really says is he says, the fruit of it will be relationships and relationally loving others. God is love. And the second commandment to love your neighbor fulfills every commandment. Galatians 5.14, Book of Romans, everywhere. Life is about people. Look at this auditorium. Just look around. Oh, you are sitting next to people. Some, somebody told me once, I don't like people. That was just last week. Someone, someone else said, the world would be a great place if it just weren't for people. To which I thought, that's really crazy logic. You think that this would be a happy place without people? You live on the planet all by yourself? See? Would that be life? Jesus is saying, life should be all about people. And as difficult as it is, you got to go love them. And so we close with this today. The promise of answered prayer comes from fruitfully loving people. Look at what he says in John 15, which is where we were in our previous series. He's in the Passion Week. He's telling them, you did not choose me, but I chose you. You're here this morning because God chose you. And I anointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide or remain, so that whatever you ask, for the, ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Whatever you ask, he says, Whatever. How many of you like that? Whenever, whatever you pray, God gives it to you. How many of you like that? Like that. Good. Okay, not everybody. Okay, that, that's a little bit of a concern. But anyway, I'm going to assume that you just didn't hear that. What, he says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you these things. I command you so that you will love one another. So what he's saying in this text is this. He's saying, I want you to bear fruit. I want you to bear a lot of fruit. I want you to pray a prayer. And know that when you pray, the, when you pray these prayers, I want to give you Whatever. You want whatever you need. Watch, here's the kicker, so that. I command you this so that you will love one another. What is Jesus referring to when he's talking about fruit here? He's talking about people. He says, I have chosen you, I have anointed you, I have appointed you to go and cultivate seeds of love that people might be touched and reached with the gospel. You have been chosen for that. You have been called to that. And if you will put my agenda and my kingdom first, which involves loving people with the gospel, whatever can become yours. We head to Easter this coming week. And here's my appeal to you, is as you've cultivated seeds of love in your relationships of people that don't know Jesus... Do not, inv okay, let me just make a comment here. 
do not invite Christians from other churches. We don't have room for them. They have their churches. This is not a show where we go from performance to performance. Invite people that don't know Jesus or used to come to church and used to know Jesus, and then after Easter, stay close to them. Stick with them. It's not getting them to Easter. It's not like if, you, if, you, if you're going to bear fruit, you plant the seed, you water the ground, you cultivate, you fertilize it, you throw manure on that. Oh, excuse me. And there's tender, loving care before the plant shoots up and bears fruit. But you know what, Christians, we do sometimes with Easter? We think we've done ourselves and God a favor by just getting someone there, and then after that, we forget about them. God doesn't forget about us. After Easter, Jesus drew closer. He sent the promise of His Spirit to live in us, that He would never leave us or forsake us. Next week, we're saying, by the way, to the 915 service, because it's like 1,300 people at one point, it becomes a bad experience for people who don't know Jesus yet. And we're looking for some people to maybe consider the 1115 service, the Saturday night, Saturday night service where we'll have an Easter egg hunt and with money in it, in the eggs. <laughs> After the 1115 service, we're having food and we're going to give away free iPads. We're going to do everything. <laughs> okay, I'm lying. Sorry. Okay, we're trying to... Now, I'm not saying don't go, don't go, brah, I'm not coming to church then. Listen, if the 915 service is the only service that you're unchurched friends and family can come to, then come here. But if, especially if you can bring them to one of the other services where they have better looking preachers, younger guys that actually look attractive, bring them there. Tell your neighbor, he's talking to you, possibly, possibly. But listen, if this is the place for you, Look, and this is the place you feel they would best receive, then come, okay? This is not a disclaimer to, to say, hey, stay away from the 915 stuff. You get the tension, right? But it's like this. If we're going to cultivate plants where the planting of the Lord, Isaiah says, that bear fruit, we have to treat it with tender, loving care. For over 30 years, Dan and Julie Ihara, who are my guest spots this morning, have walked with the Lord, and not all of it has been fun. And by the way, when you come to the Lord, if you're a seeker here this morning or you've come this week because you ain't coming next week because of the big crowd. When you come to Jesus, it's a ride. Baby, it's a ride. It's not going to be all good because we live in a world where the devil is trying to take you out as well. And so God will use adversity to show you how powerful his victory can be. And Dan and Julia Hara, if when you meet them here, you're going to go, and it looks familiar. I see them at the wall at Ala Moana Center. Okahala Mall. I see them in the newspaper. That's right. This is them. They're realtors and fruit-bearing believers. Will you welcome Dan and Julie Ihara to join me? Are you really 410? Oh, for 11 and a half. Okay, okay. Sorry. And about a that. half. Okay. Get that half in there. Um, 28, over 28 years ago, I did your wedding. And here's a shot of that moment. Let's take a look at that. There we are. Yeah. I don't know what you're ooing and aahing at. Quite frankly, I'm a little offended. <laughs> yes. Uh, I had black hair back then, and you look the same. You You're look right. exactly the same. Let's take a look at the couple without the guy in the middle. There you go. Whoo, stunning. That's stunning. Look at them. <laughs> Julie, first of all, let me just say, you haven't changed. You look exactly like, obviously, you're in your wedding, dude, garb and all that. You look exactly you, you can the move same. On. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, <sighs> what I've been really blessed with is through thick and thin, you've walked with the Lord. Lots of people start well and they fade when adversity hits. Uh, you didn't fade, you found faith. And you went from level to level. And of course, you bore fruit. You have three boys. Let's take a look at them. This is just last week's Midweek magazine, yes, right? Yes, Let's take a look. 
Uh, what are their names? Uh, James is on the left, uh, Mike is in the middle, and then Randy's on the right. Okay. Um, what, they go, what, what, what are their ages? So, uh, and... Mike is the oldest in the middle. He goes to UH. He's 21. Uh, James on the left is 18. He's going to MidPAC, graduating this year. And wow. Randy's uh, 16 at MidPAC. He's going to be a, okay. he's you, a junior now. Uh, what school did you, did you go to? I went to MidPAC. You went to MidPAC? <laughs> okay. Um, I went to... <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't get into Farrington. You went to MidPAC. <laughs> what school did you go to? Public school. Yeah! Okay, how many of you drive a Toyota? Thank you. Well, she came from the Fukunaga family, which pretty much was Surfco Toyota for many, many years here. And so uh, it is the number one car in the world. How many of you don't drive a Toyota? Uh, you can't go to heaven until you do. <laughs> <laughs> Let me brag on you a little bit. Obviously, the message frames you well. I can't believe it's taken 30 years to get you up here. Um, you're in the Hall of Fame in your business as a realtor. That's amazing. For 11 years straight, top 100 realtors. In fact, the Black Book Award, top 25. And this is a consecutive run. This is very, very impressive. And you've only been in the business for 13 years. Obviously, you've heard the voice of God. You were in the car industry, right, and successful and had the courage to leave it when the Lord said to leave and to go. And we're going to hear about how you hear the Lord's voice. But then, when we, people look at this, they can go, oh, wow, you know, their face is in, you know, in the papers, on the walls. And but we all know God takes us through the cross before the resurrection. There were a couple experiences that formed you. Talk to us about that. So, uh, after the car business, I got into uh, selling waterproof cameras around the world with a friend of mine. And uh, did very well for three or four years. And, and then one of our largest clients, uh, they had the tsunami in Phuket. I don't know if you remember, in December, and I can't remember what year it was. Uh, tsunami wiped out Phuket, where, where my, my client was. And uh, basically, he called me and asked me to give him back his money. And I said, absolutely. What else can we do for you? Well, my business partner orig originally agreed to refund him the money, because we could always sell the product to somebody else. And... And over in the next month or so, he said, oh, yeah, I'll get to it. Never did. Months went on. After th during the fourth or fifth month, he starts joking about it. I said, you know, this is not a laughing matter. This is serious. These, these people are lucky to be alive. And we have a lot of their money. We need to give it back to them. We promised them we would do that, yeah. and we didn't do that. Uh, to, got to a point where uh, I just said, you know what? I, I can't work with you anymore. Uh, it, you're impacting my integrity. Uh, it's my word that I said, and in, in your word that you said you do this and you're not going to do it, and uh, I can't live with that. So I walked away from a business. Uh, I walked away from interest and ownership in a company and said, you can have it all back. I'm you, just, you left it all behind. I, I got to find something else to do. Over uh, principle that comes from the Bible right. in your heart. Well, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, went into a small group after seeing a friend of mine, and... Um, I uh, met somebody that introduced me to real estate and said, you know, you ought to be going to real estate. Did you have private experience in real estate? No experience in real estate. Uh, I, I, I lived in a piece of home, uh, but that's about all I knew about it. Uh, and Then all of us have experience in real estate. <laughs> yeah, okay. And I just, we just took the leap of faith. Julie and I, we prayed about it, and we said, is this what we want to do? And no, in real estate, you don't get paid until you actually close something, which could be months down the road. Well... We had six months. We said, you know, we'll need at least six months of savings in the event I don't make any money for six months. And, you know, my, my goal at that time was really just to put food on the table. And you know, we had three young boys. Um, my intention was just to make sure they get food um, and, and live a normal life. Well, our business grew dramatically. Uh, our faith grew, and then all of a sudden our business started growing, and uh, we found success early on. And for, for years on, we worked 24-7. I mean, every day, every night. And I would sacrifice time away from my family and from things that are important to me because I thought this is what I was supposed to do to take care of my family. And kind of got caught up into it. You know, I just kind of uh, didn't put a focus on what mattered most uh, in life because I thought that's what mattered most. Mm -hmm. And then I, it, it was just... 
it was tough for me because we didn't know what we wanted to do other than feed the family. Yeah, other than work, right, other than work. What, what turned it? What, what was the awakening that, that, that you so, know, this ain't it? Yeah. Uh, I love to surf, so I travel and surf. I was on this little remote island in Fiji, and um, I, my friends aren't believers, so I would get up early in the morning in the dark, put my headlamp on, and sit in a little hammock on the beach in the dark by myself. You can do that at Ala Moana, North Shore. <laughs> you went to Fiji. Yeah. Why I love okay. to surf. And it's actually my time to, to have my quiet time. It's time for me to, to read the word in silence without any distractions. Because in my life, I, there's a lot of distractions in the world. And so I'm just sitting quietly, reading for about a half an hour. And I'd sit and pray and, and let God speak to me. Well, the very first wave I took off on, I wiped out and I sliced my hand open. And, and I was so mad at God because I said, you know, God, this is my time. This is... This is why I work so hard for this. I deserve to have this time, and now you just took it away from me. And I couldn't believe it, and I was just mad at God. And he said, because it's not about you. And I didn't, I didn't get that. He said, during my quiet time the next morning, he said, I need you to be uncomfortable. And then I didn't get that either. And I didn't <laughs> understand, why do I have to be uncomfortable? I have a, a good life. I, I don't... I don't do anything wrong. Why are you doing this to me? And I didn't understand. I came home, and a friend of mine said to me, hey, um, let's go start a real estate company. And I said to him, no, I'm comfortable. <laughs> and right then I heard God speak to me. He said, this is what I'm talking about. I need you to listen and be obedient. And so I was in denial. I said, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to keep on my merry way. And, and every morning, in the, I spend a lot of time in the morning. I get up early, and I read and pray, and God would say to me, this is what I'm talking about. So I finally gave in. We started building a company um, secretly because we didn't want to tell anybody what we were doing. You were working for another company. I was working yeah. for another company. And then uh, one morning, God says to me very clearly, I need you to be transparent. I need you to tell the people that you currently work for that you're going to do this. And I have a lot of business friends, and they all said, don't do it. Um, you know, that's not a good idea. Um, but every morning, God would say, you need to be transparent. I need you to be obedient. And finally, I gave in, and Julie and I went to go talk to them, and kind of was our testimony of, of our business and what's gone on for about seven years. And he kept going back to, because he's a non-believer, he kept going back to, well, it's because you work hard, because you're successful, it's because, because of you, you're successful. I said, no, you don't get it. You don't get it. He, look at all these situations that showed up that we didn't have any control over. Oh, it is oh. not us. Mm -hmm. We're not that good. Mm -hmm. We're not that smart. God worked through our life, and he didn't get that. Though he did get the fact that we were thinking of moving on, and uh, two days later, he fired us. This is... Uh, that, that was rather uh, sudden. It, yeah. yeah. And literally, I was in tears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we weren't planning to leave... In two days, we were planning to leave in one, two years mm -hmm. down the line. It was more of a courtesy to mm -hmm. not plan, not you know, mm -hmm. um, spend any money. I, I admire that. I, I understand that. Like even you know, in the church world, right? Somebody may want to plant a church. Uh, I would appreciate if they tell me early, and we can train them and prepare them. But a lot of times, people hide their intentions yeah. when it's really selfish. You didn't do that. Yeah. You did something probably in the business world. Maybe that's not done, but in the kingdom world, it is. I felt that it was important to be obedient. And at the moment, I, I felt like I filled the people around me. I filled the, Julie and, and another business partner. I, I thought I did that. But during those, so it was at 8 o'clock at night that we were given the word that you need to hand in your keys tomorrow. Uh, we had to move eight years of our stuff, literally eight years of paperwork. But during that time, I mean, it, it was, we were at peace. We didn't know where we were going to go. We didn't know what we were going to do, but it felt like that was, kind of it was that. weird. Yeah. It was weird. I just didn't understand it. Found out we went to another company, started building our, our company. Well, when we got there, we said to them, we got to be transparent. The only reason <laughs> I just got fired is because we're going to start our own company. I just need you to know that. Yeah, they probably don't get that kind of conversation yeah, too often. No. Yeah. And so we just wanted to be transparent, and yet they said, well, our job is to try to keep you. So we said, okay, great. We started 
building our company again, and then I get a call one day from somebody that says, hey, these people from the mainland want to talk to you to start another company. And say, I'm not really interested. We're going to do our own thing. And that was the first Sunday that I didn't work in years, oh. and I don't know why. Well, I kind of do now. At yeah. the time, <laughs> I did not know, yeah. Right? And uh, I, 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 we went out to meet with them. They invited us to be in, in, an investor in the company. What's the name of the company? Um, Keller Williams. Okay. Uh, Keller Williams, Honolulu. And we were able to uh, be this ground, ground floor uh, investors in the company. It has it's grown since. And so, and when I got back to at home, I was telling Julie, I said, honey, there's this company out there. They want us to be investors. I, mean, I was really excited, right? He said, you know, their mission is God, family, and the work, just like mm -hmm. what we wanted. Mm -hmm. And she asked me one question. She goes, what God are they talking about? I go, dang it, I forgot to ask that question. <laughs> <sighs> so I went online and looked, okay, yeah, yeah, they love Jesus. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> she always says that to me. <laughs> so we're, we're moving on. We're planning to make the move. We're at another company. But we've got all this groundwork to build the, the, the company. And then... I go back to Fiji again, and God says to me during my quiet time, which was really scary, um, I have something for you that's greater than you can imagine. And I don't know if you've ever heard that before. I've never heard that before. God and spoke and to it's, you. It's, yeah. It scared me. Mm. It really scared me. I didn't know what that looked like. Like, I, what if I can't handle? Why are you doing this? I, I don't get it. I walked around the island and came back to my computer, and I get an email from... Gary Keller's secretary. Gary Keller is the founder of the largest real estate company on the planet today. And I'm, I was in tears. Like, and he picked you. And he picked he me. He chose you, well, just like Jesus said he chose yeah. us. Yeah. Well, here's the weird yeah. thing. I There's wasn't no with logical him. reason for that. No. I wasn't with his company yet. Yeah. I was at another company, and he right. wanted to talk to me. Mm -hmm. He wanted to talk to me about our model with helping older adults and seniors, because he said it was very unique. And so we had a phone conversation. And we explained everything to him. And he says, you know, you have a very interesting model. I've never seen this before. I study agents. Can you come and share that with our company? I said, yeah, sure, I can do that. We were still at this other company. We transfer our license. In two weeks, we show up in Austin, Texas. Again, we don't know anybody. This is apparently a pretty big company. Mm -hmm. We walk through these black curtains, and I looked around. I go, holy smokes, this is a big room. And she goes, honey, there's a stage up there. I go, where? <laughs> it's like there were nine large, huge TV screens, way bigger than this, uh -huh. before the stage. And I go, there is a stage up there. And she goes, I think you're going to talk on that stage. And my body does one of these. <laughs> I go, oh. and I started, you, you mentioned it was 15,000 people. 15,000 people. And yeah. I looked up into the sky. I said, I was just in tears. Like, this is what you're talking about. Yeah. And I didn't get it. You know, but he made himself real to us. Uh, we've been blessed since then. Our business has grown enormously. Uh, we've over f almost 400% larger than we were before we got here just three years ago. Increase. Uh, increase is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and the opportunities have risen dramatically. You went through two seasons of decrease, and yeah. then in a moment, God literally parts the curtains, yeah. and it's increase. And I Googled you. And I went, oh, my God, because I know their journey. I know the pain. Um, Keller Williams is a Christian company. Yes. This is a man of God who preaches this and probably does it better. Actually, I've been in his office, and there are dozens of Bibles all out, and there's one right in the middle of his desk that that's his working Bible that he reads every morning. His... In the book called The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, he talks about his life, about um, you wake up in the morning, you do your devotions, devotions you yeah. read, you pray, you exercise, you have breakfast with your family, you go to work, you come back, you have dinner with your family. And most realtors don't see that kind of life. Mm -hmm. We think it, we didn't yeah. before we came to the company. Yeah. We work 24 7. We missed so many things of, of life that we couldn't believe it. You had a chance. Hurricane Harvey hits, the worst hurricane in, Houston, in Texas history slamming into Houston, and we see the kingdom first demonstrated. Talk to us about what happened. Uh, August, I think August 14th, uh, Hurricane Harvey hits Houston, Texas. 
uh, we had planned, the company has planned uh, the large event, uh, Mega Camp, where 15,000 people from all over the world sh show up in Austin, Texas, to uh, go through training and coaching. And Gary Keller, the founder, within seven days says, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do anything about ourselves. We're going to shut it down. And he spent millions of dollars getting it ready. Shut it down, and we're going to do Mega Relief. Mega Relief is to help those in need, and we're not going to talk business. We're going to go and serve. Um, so we decided to go. There's about 5,000 people that showed up mm -hmm. in Austin, Texas, and we took a two-hour bus ride to Houston every I day. Mean, there were bus loads. Yeah. 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 And millions of dollars that your company donated to the relief. Yes, millions. 20, $20 million. Mm -hmm. Kingdom first. And uh, how did this experience form you? And there you are. Uh, on the ground, hands at work. It, it, it's life-changing. If you've never been into a war zone, this was a war zone. Uh, imagine when we were leaving Austin, everything looks great. We get to Houston, everything looks, why are we here? Everything's nice until we get to this area. Right. And then your jaw drops and you look around and there's trash eight to ten feet high along the street as far as you can see. Everywhere is full of trash because... When the flood hit, the, the levees broke and waters rose so high that there's six to eight feet of water in the house, inside every home. So nothing was salvaged. Everything had to be thrown away. And it sat there for weeks. And then the smell and the stench just got to us. Our goal was to demuck, they call it. There's a term I didn't even know about. There's a demucking, is going through a home and ripping everything out of the home except for the concrete slab and the, and the studs. And I'm not a blue collar, I'm, my, I'm as white as a white collar guy can be. And uh, I, I said, you know, we, we need to do this. And it was, it was an amazing experience. Julie, you had, a, you had a heart to serve in a specific way. Talk to us. So while we were at Herbert Kane Harvey um, prior to this, um, my, my heart was to pray, to go there and to pray for the people and meet meet the people, meet the victims. So the first day we get there and we go, we get bussed over to Houston and we worked with Second Baptist Church and they had a huge um, food bank. And so that's where we served. So we were in charge of intake for food, for clothing, for toiletries, for anything you can think of that you need. Um, and we were processing. So it means you're standing there for hours, looking at clothes, sorting them, putting into different piles. And so in the midst of that, after a few hours, I, I would just sigh and I said, God, this is not really what I wanted to do. I want to pray. I want to meet the people. Mm -hmm. And so, I, but I kept going and God said, stop, look around and learn as much as you can about how this process is done. What are they intaking? How are they sorting? How is the operation set up? So I went to each area and I, I watched. Um, but I thought to myself, why am I learning this? Why do I need to know this? I, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, the second day, we went out again, and we went to a different site. Uh, Dan was out demucking homes, and I went to another processing center. And same thing, you, there's hundreds of people there, and they give you your assignments. Well, this time they said, okay, we need 10 people, just 10, to, to meet the victims and to help them. And so I just prayed. I said, God, please let me be one of the 10. And I'm thinking, oh, not likely. There's hundreds of people here. I was selected as, as one of the 10 to greet um, the victims and talk to them. And so they would drive up in their cars. And what really struck me is that these natural disasters, there's no discrimination. People would drive up in old beat-up trucks. They drive up in their Mercedes. They drive up in these beautiful cars, and they would be just humbled. And we need, we need a toothbrush. We need, you know, diapers. It was um, very, very emotional. Anyway, so the, the good part was that I did get to pray with almost all of them, and they were all very open, and so that was such a blessing. And yes. you have since connected. Why did I have to go through this systems of sorting, intake, and outtake? Because you have a non, not-for-profit that's a beautiful thing. You have won the Outstanding Service Award nationally. And talk to us about this. So the National Association of Realtors gives out two awards a year for, to a realtor uh, who pr presents himself for, to serve older adults. And we were given that one award uh, over 1.4 million people. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a really big honor to, to do that. But, you know, we don't, I, I don't really care for the accolades as much as really what we're doing. Um, 
you know, in our world, you know, Gary Keller always says, money is good for the good it does. And he said uh, he wanted all of us to, in our, in our top agent group, to create a nonprofit, to make a difference in the world. Uh, and so we came back and we said, we're going to create Silver Spoons. Silver Spoons is a nonprofit designed to take care of older adults who cannot take care of themselves. You know, most of our clients come from means. They have a home, they have a car, uh, but there's over 16,000 older adults living alone in a rental that, you know, is not a safe place to live, or they might even be get kicked out of their uh, rental. That's and we're called to help them. That's a, no, that's an incredibly beautiful thing. There's a lot... It's kind of like we need to, to have you for part two, but a parting shot, a parting shot for us today. And I, thank you for serving the Lord through thick and thin and being a tremendous example. Lives, many, many lives have been touched, brought to Christ because of you. Parting shot, Dan. I think the Lord's worked in my life um, in one real specific way, and that's my time in the morning uh, to read his word and to listen to him, to be silent, you know, because the only time... Because I'm so busy during the day, I don't, I'm so busy, I don't hear him. I don't allow my time and opportunity to hear him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my only call out to you is to, to find time to do that, to find time to be silent and listen to what the Lord's asking you to do. And every time you said that to me, I knew it was him because I wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's asking me to do things that it's not me. This devotional time with Scripture and prayer has been your practice daily now. Yes. And that's where... Yeah. Kingdom first, God first. Julie. So a couple of things. So one thing is um, with Silver Spoons, we just started, you know, we're brand new, and we'll start off, as, as Dan mentioned. Um, as I was praying last week, God gave me a vision, and it's to really grow it, and it's um, in addition to helping the older adults who cannot help themselves, it's to start a resource center to connect the younger generation with the older generation, mm-hmm. to create a mentorship, to create um, programs, um, such as end-of-life prayer ministry, as well as maybe a make-a-wish for older adults, not just, you know, how there's already one for children, but for older adults, and different projects. So they're already, he gave me four pages of vision of what this is going to look like. And so um, my party shot is that prayer works. And I know it sounds very cliche, and it, it however... Prayer does work. We serve a big God, and God doesn't want you to pray for little things that, oh, yeah, we, you, we know we could accomplish. So he gave this huge vision, and I'm thinking, I don't know how we're going to do this. I have no idea. However, every step of the way, it's like, okay, God, you gave us this vision, so help us because we don't know how to raise funds. We don't know how to, you know, start a research, you know, all of these things. Um, and so every step of the way, it's it's prayer. Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added to you. Julie's part of our early morning intercessory prayer team, and they get up and pray while we're sleeping. They get up, get up and pray on Saturday when I'm sleeping, okay? And um, <clears throat> we have some of them up there in the rises praying for every service, praying for the city, praying for us. Um, this woman lives prayer, and it's leaked over to you now, uh, but there was a demonstration of taking the kingdom power and authority against the enemy. Talk to us about what happened. So we're in um, Austin, Texas at uh, Mega Relief to serve the victims at Harvey. And we come out of an event, and it's in a darker area, a lot of trees and just not much lighting. And a large gentleman approaches me and asks me for money. And, you know, I, I just, I was like, well, you know, he's, kind of burly looking guy. Just, I, I was a little afraid of him, actually. So I kind of did not to have eye contact, and he kept having conversation with me. And then he asked me a question. So what, you, you Japanese? You Chinese? I go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm Japanese. Yeah, I'm Japanese. Yeah, he goes, oh, you Japanese, Chinese people. Yeah, you don't give anything. Nah, nah, nah. He starts going off on me. Now I'm kind of getting mad, right? He's like, I was going to give you something, but now I'm kind of offended. <laughs> and, I'm, you know, he starts going at me verbally, and I'm trying to contain myself, and I was just about ready to approach him, and my four foot ten wife, this four foot eleven and a half. Okay, in the morning, um, this guy is about six two, six four. He comes right up to me, and then my little wife steps. I was here, and my my wife steps up to me. She goes. You, I rebuke you, devil. Satan, get out of me. Say, Satan, leave us. I rebuke you. You did that. I did. It was the Holy Spirit. I was not thinking, okay? I saw him Evidently, and I said, yeah. 
He is a demon and he does not belong here. And there are all these people here who are doing good and he was a distraction. And, I said, and after that, I thought, oh my gosh, what did I just do? I was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, what happened? Who, like, who are you? Like, who is this lady? Uh-huh. <laughs> and I, I was blown away. And interestingly enough, he turned his back and walked away. And you know that was the Satan. You just watched the whole thing. I, I watched the whole thing. And, you know, we did well. We did well. We, we had the guy going. She did well. <laughs> Dan and Julie Ihara. All these things will be added unto you if you put him first. Thank you so much. We'll see you at City Thank Side. You. Can I pray? Yes. But we're going to have you come to the front. Julie's going to close this part out in prayer before we go to communion. Okay. And we'll be at your right and left hand. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's all bar our hearts. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. We just humbly come before you, Lord. We praise you for who you are, for... You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are the one that gives us our strength, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for everything, Lord. We thank you for our leadership, Lord. We thank you for Pastor Norman, all of the pastors. We thank you for their unity, Lord. We thank you for all the volunteers. We thank you for everyone that works behind the scenes so hard, Lord, to make everything happen each week, Lord. And Father God, we lift up each one that is sitting here, that is hearing today's message, or hearing it on the podcast, or wherever else they're hearing it, Lord. We ask that you bless them, Lord, that there's a reason why that they're hearing the message, Lord. I pray for leadership in the church, Lord, that it's not just the leaders that come up here and speak, or that serve, or leaders in area. It's each one of you Lord, um, that sits in each one of these seats. Each one of you is a leader in your own right. And whether you believe it or not, God has gift, given you gifts and talents to use in your leadership and leadership starts with you with your individual person that you can lead yourself in in serving our lord and then it will spread lord to leading your family and then leading your influence your circle of influence and then your community and then the world lord so we just ask that you use each one here lord we ask that you give each person boldness lord to really live their dreams. Look at the, um, I pray for vision. I pray for those that don't yet know you, Lord, that you will make yourself real without a shadow of a doubt that you are real, Lord. I pray for boldness that each one will ask somebody that's unchurched, Lord, or not a believer to come into the house next week, Lord. And I also pray for each one that they increase their prayer, Lord, and that they come to Saturday morning or Wednesday night to learn more about prayer, Lord. I just ask that you, um, that you protect each one here and that you just, in their quiet time, Lord, that you speak to each one on where you want them to be, Lord. Help us to be in the center of your will each and every day. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We bless you. And everyone says, amen. Amen. Can we give it up for Dan and Julie? Thank you so much.